Welcome to the news, everybody. Welcome to the first week of 2020. That's right, it's recently become 2,020 years since the commonly believed time in which God once boned and then came, just the one time. And you know what? I feel pretty good about it. I've been, I've been walking, eating more plants, and the blood screams have subsided. No more stress sloughing of the flesh, got new teeth, this is the first video we recorded after the holiday break, a break which has invigorated this Cody, making him ready to take on a new year of new news with resolute optimism and a let's go attitude. It's time to drain the swamp inside of ourselves with a brand new show. We're changing everything, folks. So allow me to be the first to introduce to you the first week of 2020. New year, new Cody. New Shoddy. It's the same background, but you know, it's expensive. Hi, I've apparently teamed up with Skillshare and Skill there, offering two free months of premium membership. Just click the link in the description or go to Skillshare.com slash some more news to get two free months of premium membership and explore your creativity. 2020 is here. It's a year of Oh boy, it is a year. So use your time to explore new skills, grow, learn, be creative in a supportive community in a way that fits your schedule of not living under your desk, I assume. I took this Skillshare class from Fraser Davidson, and now, hi, here's some, this guy, the Some More News mascot, Smoofle Doofle. Hi, Smoofle Doofle. Anyway, Click the link in the description to get two free months of premium membership and explore your creativity. Look, we can't change the news, but what we can change is how we emotionally process the news. We can either throw up our hands and declare defeat, or we can figure out constructive and positive angles conducive to future growth. So let's do that. Let's look at the first week of 2020 and reflect on the totally fantastic year ahead of us all. What do we got? Give me some sopping fresh 2020 news starting on January 1st. It was daytime, but it was black. You know, everything was black and it just moved that quick. I couldn't believe how, you know, when you came up out of the water and, and you saw the trees that... But it was all the, it was just flying up the trees, you know, it was the way it moved, you know, it was like in steps. And just, how long did you have to stay in the water for? Oh, overall, we were in the water for about, oh, easy an hour, but, mm. uh, you know, it sort of felt a lot more. Right. Okay. Not a great start to the new year because it just so happens that the entire country of Australia, I guess, is um, on fire. Like the whole country, which is a continent, and a lot of people are dying horribly, and countless animals and wildlife are also dying horribly, and almost every image of it is like a, a, a dagger right in your heart, especially since the scale is unimaginable, and the country's leaders are about as bad at handling it as any other world leader. And that whole climate change angle, a lot of, a lot of doom, Terrible, horrible doom. Yeah, there it is, just the, just the worst thing. And we'll probably have to do a larger video talking exclusively about Australia at some point that will likely be you know, a real tale of rage and sadness. But hey, that first clip I showed you about the woman who jumped into a lake, she and her daughter were saved by a man on a jet ski. So that's neat. Some kind of an action film. Like the movie Hard Rain, but with a lot more dead koalas. Like, like if you stacked all the koala bodies killed in the wildfire in a straight line, there would be enough to reach Mount Everest twice. That's 
pretty impressive. Look, maybe the Australian wildfires aren't the best foot to start on for this new and constructive show, for this new and constructive year. I should have been more selective about what we're gonna cover. That's on me and I apologize. Is there any other news from the first day of January? Ah, okay, that's, wow. No one is having a good time in that headline. Any other January 1st news we can look at? That's just terrible. Okay, let's skip to the next. Okay, that's like, that's like the same headline as the last one, but also isn't, and that makes it more disturbing. And maybe we should have a conversation about guns and who gets to have guns. And like, maybe cops shouldn't have, no. No, none of that. We're, we're, we're gonna skip to the next day, all right? Skip to January 2nd. Ha, shucks. Skip that. Okay, no, not for the first episode back. All right, we're, we'll find a constructive way to talk about that at some point, but not this point, all right? What else was happening on January 2nd? Fine. I can't keep re-rolling, so let's talk about the anti-Semitism. And there's some kind of nice news about how 10,000 people got together to protest this recent rise of anti-Semitic attacks right at the end of 2019. But also, this just in, there was a really sudden and horrible rise in anti-Semitic attacks right at the end of 2019. And what's worse is the entirety of 2019 as a whole also saw a giant rise in anti-Semitic attacks in New York City, from 186 incidents in 2018 to 234 the following year. But to be fair and balanced, Hate crimes, in general, were up last year. Not just in New York, but everywhere. So that's, that's very bad news. It's, it's, it's objectively all bad news. Not a lot of golden goodies to sift from these ashes. But, oh, wait, here's a headline saying that hate crimes, in general, were down. But here's a more specific headline noting that violent hate crimes were up. So, like, less hate crimes, but the hate crimes that were happening were worse. Specifically, murder was worse. So I guess, congratulations to the concept of hate crimes for becoming more streamlined? That does not feel like the right take. Okay, also, these increased hate crimes are specifically targeting Latinos and transgender people, which might, um, might indicate that maybe, maybe someone, some kind of authority figure, perhaps in, in, in a role model position, leading a, a, a culture war, is influencing people toward that kind of hate crime. Look, I'm not exactly sure how to frame this in a way that's constructive and shows hope for 2020 and doesn't fill everyone's brains with gushing rage blood. And then you get the blood screams and tip over an airport kiosk in front of your entire family. So let's pivot to world news. Nope. That's just the same hate crimes. Skip, skip, skip. Different world news. What? No, we already did the fires. Jesus, okay. I Let's go back to the dead mountain lions. Phew, ah, oh, whoo, yeah. yeah. What a sunny breath of fresh air that is. That's a, that's a, that's a nice, cushy story about slaughtered wildcats. So it turns out that the body they were eating wasn't a hiker they killed or anything like that. So that's good news. It was merely a dead body that someone else put there. After a murder, one assumes. Most likely this suspect they found. But, 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 but maybe they died naturally and were then brought to the wilderness afterward. Like out of spite or something. We don't have to jump to the worst conclusions about the dead mountain lions that were found eating a corpse in the woods. And in other dead mountain lion news, the state of California is having a big problem with mountain lions that have been killed by accidentally ingesting rat poison that was introduced through the food chain. So there's a, there's a clear lesson there, something we can do better at, which is to avoid using poisons to kill pests in our home and just Use those snapping traps instead of, the, you know, the ones that the, they, they break their neck, assuming they work properly and don't just slowly strangle the rodent. Or maybe we can get one of those big buckets to drown them overnight. Drown mice. Also, if you're going to kill somebody, 
dump the body in a river or a sewer and avoid wildlife areas. So lions don't eat the body and develop a lust for human flesh and are put down by the cops. Gun havers who maybe shouldn't have guns. Failing that, be sure to put the body in a steel drum or perhaps chopped up in some secure luggage if you absolutely have to dispose of it in the woods. Is what I guess is the growth we should strive for here. Or, if we're gonna poison mountain lions like villains, maybe we shouldn't also shoot them when they realize that we taste delicious. Even the odds a little bit, you know? Like, like sure, they found out our secret. The thing we've been keeping from dogs all these years. That humans are super easy to kill and very, very scrumptious. But I don't know, we're like, really hurting the environment and poisoning them and all those koalas from before. So maybe it's time that the juggernauts of the woods lurch from the shadows and devour our species because man, okay, this isn't constructive either. Ah, uh, this is tough. Okay, I'm gonna figure this new show out, all right? We're, we're just working out the kinks is all. What happened on January 3rd? Iran is vowing revenge after a US drone strikes in Baghdad killed the country's top general Qasem Soleimani. Okay, let's just put a big fat pin in 2020 for a moment. We're gonna shift gears, get loose, you know? We're gonna, we're gonna loosen ourselves up. And you know, I've been told that I've been doing this show since the previous year before this one. So maybe it could be fun to reflect on just how far we and most specifically, I have come on this show. It's time for a new segment called Whatever the Year Was Before 2020, A Look Back. Working tirelessly like I do to bring you an endless stream of hot Cody on news action makes it difficult to stop and reflect on the stories we've covered in the past. Something that one could argue is crucial in taking in the whole picture to get perspective from a less emotionally invested point so that we could perhaps react better in the future when a similar story arises. For example, remember that Nick Sandman kid who allegedly rational adults wanted to smack when he stood in front of a Native American man in a MAGA hat while his buddies made racist chants? Now that we've had time to stop and reflect on that and perhaps our own adolescent foibles, that video now looks... I'm so looks about the same. Pretty frustrating to watch even after a year. But it's true that people, specifically Twitter and the media, absolutely did not handle that video well at all. And I'm certainly no Sandman fan, Sandfin, but like, as we explained in the previous year, we really whiffed what could have been a constructive moment in all this Trump noise. But we didn't. So instead, he sued the Washington Post and CNN, causing the latter to settle and the former to wind up having a judge rule that the lawsuit is valid. And even though the lawsuits have been whittled far, far down from their original claims, the kid probably has a good case and is gonna be treated like a victory in the war against fake news by reasonably brained people. And that will frustrate a lot of other people and we'll all just end up where we started, but way more angry and damaged, like some kind of Greek myth about purgatory and insanity and hats. Except one person did seem to grow from this, at least in a way that does matter. And that is Nick Sandman himself, who very recently stood up for Greta Thunberg when she got dogpiled with hate from the MAGA-leaning crowd of, uh, I don't know, are they still climate change deniers or have they transitioned into like an anti-Earth the turtle's stance at this point. I'm not sure. I don't know what kind of shoddy mind shanty proudly ejaculates memes comparing a girl worried about climate change with a Nazi. Like, what? What is that? Someone help that unhinged internet maniac. But my point is that not only is Sandman defending Greta, but rightfully pointing out that just because someone thinks that he was treated badly by liberals and or the media doesn't justify paying the hate forward to this new adolescent target. That said, it sure would be nice if he also took her side on climate change and didn't weirdly avoid the topic when addressing her, but, I mean, whatever, not my problem. 
or rather, not as much my problem as it will be his and his children's problem. And like a really big problem at that. But again, whatever. Good job, Nico the Sands. Way to agree to the very basic level of decency of not bullying teenagers like yourself because they are worried about climate change. And also, get money because the media slightly mischaracterized the time your friends mocked a Native American guy who approached you at a protest while you were wearing the Pocahontas hat. And so your family hired a really high profile libel lawyer and a PR firm to handle the fallout. Whatever! This is exhausting and not constructive, so let's just, let's just talk about climate change. A way more fun topic and a subject of that newfangled what if we did something about stuff party we discussed back in the year that was before 2020. And the Green New Deal, an idea that dared to actually address the concept of perhaps giving a shit. And then we all just forgot about that. Maybe because the original bill was presented as being very broad and by a broad. <laughs> Always getting her hair done, am I right guys? <laughs> uh, uh. Or maybe it was forgotten because socialism is scarier than the planet dying, I guess. It certainly seems to scare the president, who has reportedly said in private that socialism would be difficult to beat in the general election, which sure seems like a thing we should stop and consider when looking at the current 2020 candidates and maybe thinking about how the last person to win, Donald Trump, was a populist with an extremely uncentrist campaign running against the opposite of that, and maybe that's a sign that we shouldn't gravitate toward a figure that represents the continuation of a status quo that Americans are clearly fed up with and doesn't even seem like he is even really on the same ideological page as the more invigorating and relevant people representing their party. I, I don't know. I'm just spitballing here. Spitting on the old, the old balls. And speaking of old spittled balls, here's Bill O'Reilly talking about how no one cares about AOC, the woman that Fox News was at one point mentioning on average 76 times a day. I think she will endorse Elizabeth Warren. Uh, number two, Warren's strength is in Iowa though, not really across the board. Uh, number three, no one cares about Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez's <laughs> endorsement outside of the very slender far-left socialist movement. Mm. Sage wisdom from old Billiam. Who, as this photo clearly shows, was totally right in his seasoned prediction that Ocasio-Cortez would endorse Elizabeth Warren and that no one would care about the extremely charismatic and good-looking working-class political figure who loves to dance. Yes, no one would give two wet squats outside of a fringe group of radicals. Look at them. Look at these dwindling beatniks. A mere handful of extremists out to see AOC speak at a Warren rally. The person she absolutely endorsed, definitely, but totally won't boost the campaign of. Yes, that Bill O'Reilly is definitely someone we should listen to about politics and things. And if other, more liberal pundits are sort of echoing that sentiment, we should listen to them too. But again, no one cares about AOC, right? She doesn't matter. And that's why an Alabama candidate rolled out the conservative squad at the beginning of December, a group of white women devoted to making conservatives cool again and combat the scourge of socialism. Jessica, congratulations, you actually did this. Yes, ma'am, thank when you When you look at us. these ladies that wanna form a conservative squad with you, what goes through your mind? You know, I'm just honored that they want to join in this fight, and that's exactly what it is. You know, we are losing the younger generations of this country, and I'm so grateful that they're willing to join up and help in this cause. Probably important and definitely hilarious to know that these are all candidates. They're branding themselves this for, for their candidacy. They're not, they didn't, they're not even there yet. They're, just, it's, they're running on being the conservative version of the people nobody cares about. Honestly, it's a little refreshing to see a conservative not pretend like AOC isn't a big influence. So kudos to that, Jessica Taylor, a, um, a CEO of an Alabama grant consulting firm who tweets photos of herself and her husband in rich bastard clothes, for thinking about how to appeal to the youth of today with a website that encourages you to dunk on socialism by purchasing this beige basketball. 
Congrats on putting together a whole squad of hip conservative women, such as this Gen Xer, whose husband was the executive director of a pro-life group, this real estate agent who tweeted out a Photoshop of AOC crying at a detention camp, and this Texas mayor that Trump appointed as the Housing and Urban Development Regional Administrator despite the fact that she once, and this is real life, spoke at the Texas Homeland Security Forum and asked lawmakers to take action against the rise of Sharia law being imposed on Texas. A completely unfactual thing, originating from a chain letter hoax she probably read about in Breitbart. Despite it being a, um, a lie. She would go on to hail herself as a hero, then make the news another time for defending a school for having a Muslim teen arrested for building a clock. Remember that? Remember the clock, kid? And then putting the town she was mayor of on the map for its rampant Islamophobia. Way to be a mayor, you, you, you. Member of the conservative squad, the hip new squad for youngsters, with a YouTube page containing two videos and 93 subscribers. This is so amazing. Our country is so great. We're, there are other countries where women can't even drive. I love granddads everywhere, but this is not your grandfather's <laughs> GOP anymore. We're, we're stuck on impeachment right now. Nothing's getting done. But they have plenty of time for impeachment and the sham that that is. And instead, all we've seen mm -hmm. is a focus on impeachment. And it is political theater as a mayor of the city of Irving. That's great. And then for the last two and a half years, I've been part of the Trump administration. The impeachment is a hoax. It's a sham. I love granddads everywhere, but this is not your grandfather's <laughs> GOP anymore. Kids love spending their time defending their old, rich war crime president. Anyway, what was I talking about? The Green New Deal. God, get your affairs in order, Cody. What is this, blank? Oh my God, they're all blank! Anyway, AOC and Sanders just introduced a Green New Deal bill specific to public housing, honing in the, the broader idea and actually pushing to, to, to do something about something. The plan would be to use seven grant programs to overhaul one million public housing units to make them sustainable. But on top of that, add things like organic grocery stores and childcare so that the less fortunate can still have access to a healthy lifestyle. And to top it off, the members of each public housing community would be given preference in hiring for employees of that service as well. The entire idea is to create new jobs and help the working class while also benefiting our environment. You know, things that young people might enjoy, as opposed to obsessively defending our crime president and demonizing Muslim children. Jeez. Okay, so I feel like I could have just talked about AOC without bringing up all those other terrible people and things. I had an opportunity to be, to be completely constructive, and I blew it. You blew it, Cody! But I'll do better with the next story, all right? We're gonna hit that luscious positivity groove. What's the next update on the year before 2020? Gah! Let's not, let's not? Okay, look, maybe it's time to stop giving QAnon attention, and they'll just, and they'll, they'll just go away and fade out in 2020, despite being constantly promoted by the President of the United States of America. I'm sure that won't totally uh, embolden them. Well, we broke the seal. Any other, any other Trump follow-up news that could drive me further into the inky mud of despair, like that fucking horse in that fucking movie with that fucking book? Oh, right. He's building a wall. He did the thing, the thing he said he'd do. 100 miles of it, good for him? Although if you read further into the article, you'll discover that the more exact number of 98 miles wasn't actually new border walls, but replacing dilapidated and outdated parts of the wall that were already in place. And at this rate, it's not very likely that Trump will hit his goal of 450 miles of new wall by 2020 this year, but shh, promises kept. Mexico, thank you for paying for the wall that we built. As we mentioned last year, it, it was super effective and all the experts support it and think it's not a waste of money and time. So thank you, Mexico. 
Anyway, on the subject of things that are stupid and slow, and also stupid, but especially dumb and slow, let's check back in with Fosta Sesta. If you recall, we spoke on the two anti-trafficking laws back in May of whatever year was before this one, and how the bills designed to push sex trafficking off the internet have inadvertently created a situation where sex workers were no longer able to digitally vet clients dragging the industry back to a very dangerous pre-internet era where workers were far more at risk of violence and murder, and how every goddamn sex worker at the time was pleading with the government to repeal these measures, but no one listened, causing a continued and measurable rise in violence against sex workers that we talked about. Back in November, the St. James Infirmary, a clinic that keeps track of violence against sex workers, reported a significant rise in reports since the passage of FOSTA-SESTA, at the same time as that news, it was also going around that since FOSTA SESTA had pushed everyone related to sex work offline, it was actually making it harder to catch sex traffickers. So the entire thing was doing the exact opposite of what they intended. This is all something we talked about in that video, and we'll probably have to talk about it again. Just a, just a, a completely bad idea from our government that hasn't been repealed yet. So I assume, since we're talking about it, there's been some good news, right? Like, like again, again this, this, this FOSTA SESTA has been seen by all as a colossal failure that not only doesn't catch sex traffickers, but actually endangers more lives. There's no reason it should still be a thing. So the good news is coming up. I can't wait to read it when I turn my head. Okay. So the new development is that after 18 months of failure and death, Congress has introduced a bill calling for a federal study to, if the bill is passed, look into the effects of the legislation so that they may perhaps, if they feel like it, consider introducing another bill proposing that maybe, if they feel up to it, they vote on repealing it at a later time. Great. It's not nothing very close to nothing. I'm glad they're going to create a study that can then join all the other studies already saying that FOSTA-SESTA is bad. What else happened? That definite bed bug Brett Stevens wrote a pro-eugenics op-ed using a bullshit study written by a racist as a source and then forced the New York Times to issue a disclaimer slash correction instead of, I don't know, not having Brett Stevens write for them anymore, since he now has a habit of cherry picking desperate sources to make very bad points about the world because he's a f***ing little bed bug crybaby that we already spent like 20 minutes talking about before, but nothing will ever come from it or really anything we do, and life is meaningless. Ah, oh, jeez. Cheese and crackers. Nothing about this video has been constructive, has it? I, I think I might have bitten off more than I could chew with this whole recapping the year before 2020 thing. I should, I, I should have known that it would, just, it, would, it would just be a bummer to look back at the past. Or, or I guess also the present. Existence is um, pain. But hey, there, there was a Star Wars recently. That's fun and escapist. How did that go? Ray Skywalker. All right. Let's just talk about Iran, I guess. F it. This was a disaster. Much like what's going on in Iran. And in case you need a refresher, after the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad was stormed by supporters of the Qatayb Hezbollah, a militia group recently responsible for the death of an American contractor, our very sharp and non-slurpy little guy was given a list of options for retaliation, one of which was the assassination of Qud General Qasem Soleimani. Now, it's been reported that the people who presented this option didn't think Trump would pick it, because of how extreme it was, and only included it to make the other options seem reasonable. But that could also just be like people covering their asses after the fact, especially since many in our military would love nothing more than to kill Soleimani, considering that it was his Quds force that provided training to militants in Iraq on IEDs that would go on to target our soldiers. It's complicated and emotional for our generals, which is why decisions like these aren't up to them. 
And in the past, killing Soleimani, while satisfying, was considered strategically dangerous by previous presidents. And like, in general, maybe it's bad that the president can just designate any bad guy a terrorist and the media will gobble it up and the vice president will lie about that bad guy's connection to 9-11 and just, we, we love making bad guys and killing them, I guess is my point. A thing that naturally Trump just went ahead and did. Just dick first into that turd volcano. He launched a strike against Soleimani claiming that it was to prevent an immediate threat to the US, which he first claimed was to bomb our embassy but then expanded it to four embassies. And then we also learned that there was a second and unsuccessful attack on another Iranian military official in a totally different place at the same time. So that's odd and doesn't fit his justification. Also, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo went on TV and said of the threats, quote, There is no doubt that there were a series of imminent attacks that were being plotted by Qasem Soleimani we don't know precisely when, and we don't know precisely where. We don't know when, but they were imminent at, at a certain time. Well, not a time, because we don't know when, but it, they, they were gonna happen imminently. What an enigma this Trump fellow is. A real human conundrum, like a, like a, like a fucking liar. And then he threatened to commit war crimes, like multiple categories of war crimes. Oh, smorgasbord of atrocities, saying that he would symbolically attack 52 Iranian sites for each American hostage once taken by Iran, war crime number one, and those sites would be important to Iranian culture, war crime number two. War crimes being a thing that are punishable by life in prison or even death on account of being, uh, I feel like I said it out loud, I did, war crimes. Now, it's not surprising, considering Trump's well-documented love of war crimes. He talked about them proudly. Wish that was a concern a few years ago. He did it all the time. We all knew about it. There were quotes. Anywho, this was four days into the new year when he did all this. And then, when they held a closed-door briefing with senators explaining their justification for the attack, Rand Paul and Mike Lee came out of it and said this. I ha had hoped and expected to receive more information outlining the legal, factual, and moral justification for the attack. I was left somewhat uh, unsatisfied on that front. Uh, the briefing lasted only 75 minutes, whereupon our briefers left. This, however, is not the biggest problem I have with the briefing, which I would add was probably the worst briefing I've seen, at least on a military issue in the nine years I've served in the United States Senate. What I found so distressing about that briefing was that one of the messages we received from the briefers was do not debate, do not discuss the issue of the appropriateness of further military intervention against Iran. And that if you do, you'll be emboldening Iran. The implication being that we would somehow be making America less safe by having a debate or a discussion about the appropriateness of further military involvement against the government of Iran. So that's unsettling and familiar. The idea of telling Americans that they're hurting America by questioning the effectiveness or motives of a military strike. It's, it's not fun feeling like I'm on the same side as Rand Paul, that's for darn tootin', but here we are. Nor does this headline seem like it should exist in our, albeit already bizarro dimension. The risk of terror is increased by appeasement. It's a good line, and it may be true. Probably is true. Of course, the risk of terror is also increased by bombing other people's countries. That is also indisputably true. And by the way, these are the same people who lied about Iraq's weapons of mass destruction way back in 2002, and by doing that, got us into an utterly pointless war that dramatically weakened our country. Two for coitus is anti-war now? Explain yourself. But Mexico and China are also linked to the deaths of Americans. Each has flooded our country with narcotics from which tens of thousands of Americans die every single year. Not that anyone in power cares. Da. Ah, he's mad about all the foreign people coming to our country. Got it. Also, Matt Gates, who fucking loves Donald Trump, has supported a bipartisan House bill and has actually personally lobbied to limit the president's war doing powers. Something that's it's good. 
Good job, Matt. The president's mad at him, of course, and although it passed in the House and the Senate, the president vetoed the limit on his war doing powers. But, um, little victories. Meanwhile, Iran ended all their nuclear limits under the nuclear agreement that Trump already backed out of and then implemented sanctions and designated a branch of their military a terrorist organization eight months before assassinating that guy. Anyway, then Iraq voted to ask us to leave, which we have refused to do, meaning that we're uh, invading them now? Again? It's an occupation. We love occupations in the Middle East. We can't get enough of them. Our massive presence totally not causing more problems. To quote the letter refusing to leave, America is a force for good in the Middle East. Citation needed, government. We need to be there to fight ISIS, you see. ISIS being the thing that that guy we assassinated was fighting. Also, during the week, Around this time, a Ukrainian airliner was hit by a missile over Tehran, which Iran claims was unintentionally shot down, killing a bunch of Canadians who never asked to be a part of any of this. Canadians, for Pete's sake. Like, let's just not do these things that lead to more chaos and violence. What if we left and didn't... It's like... It's way too soon to really weigh in on any of this uh, substantially, other than, other than saying, like, no war with Iran, war is bad. And there's a lot to say about America's role in the Middle East and Iran specifically in our history of just f***ing things up worse and worse by meddling and coups and occupying. Like, why are we having Oliver North on TV to say that Trump was Reagan-esque in regards to Iran? We have the memories of goldfish, it's bizarre. But anyway, it, it, it seemed like a lot of people that were predicting a big dramatic World War III from this event have already come to realize that the more likely outcome is that we, we do that thing we always do in the Middle East. Remember that thing? Remember when there was an attack on American soil and then our president kinda warped that into a justification to go into Iraq because they totally had ties to Al-Qaeda. Oh, the reason I keep insisting that uh, there was a relationship between Iraq and Saddam and Al-Qaeda because there was a relationship between Iraq and Al-Qaeda. Despite us later learning that no, there objectively was no connection there, nor were there WMDs, and then a lot of people died, mostly Iraqi civilians, and then everyone pretended like they were always against going to war in the first place, and we all moved on because they made a new Batman? And not just any Batman, but a real grumpy one, doing hacking and tech and junk. He hacks bats in that film. So it's like, it's like that thing again, including the Batman part, only instead of having this big tragic event happen on our soil, the president just decided to have a Twitter fit where he and Iranian officials share low-res flag pics. And instead of it being a thinly veiled grab for resources, our president is just saying he wants oil and that we should steal oil and should have stolen oil already. Well, we should have kept the oil when we got out. And you know, it's very interesting. Had we taken the oil, you wouldn't have ISIS because they fuel themselves with the oil. That's where they got the money. So you believe we can go in and take the oil? We should have taken the oil. He's talked about this in the past in regards to other countries, suggesting we help Libya on a humanitarian basis and take half of their oil as payment, that famous humanitarian thing. Also, here's him like a day ago. Then they say he left troops in Syria. You know what I did? I left troops to take the oil. I took the oil. The only troops I have are taking the oil. They're protecting the oil. I took we're, over we're the oil. We're taking the oil. We're not taking well, the oil. Well, maybe we're, we will, maybe we won't. They're I protecting mean, we, the facility. I don't know, maybe we should take it, but we have the oil. Right now, the United States has the oil. And, you know, we haven't even talked about impeachment, which um, feels like maybe that's the reason why this Iran stuff is happening too. I don't know. Other presidents have done this exact thing. He has suggested it himself many times. Also, Maybe assassinating that guy could go on the articles of impeachment, maybe. Threatening war crimes, maybe we jot those down for the impeachment stuff, too. Especially now that we're getting reports that this entire guy
damn Soleimani strike might have been specifically carried out to appease GOP members Trump considers important in his impeachment trial. So, uh, that would be a crime. Like a huge 90s thriller level of sinister Gene Hackman type of crime. But the point is that I guess if things go bad, then we're just doing the early to late 2000s again. But without all the same comics and comedy shows that got us through that replaced with exhaustion and cynicism in the form of ruffled crazies shouting at cameras with map overlays that we couldn't afford to get a new one for this new and positive show? F***ing seriously? And of course, with somehow worse justification too. Oh, and don't forget, the much more incredibly dumb voices inevitably in the mix. Deterrence is designed to avoid war. It's why it's called deterrence. What do you think you are deterring? Oh no! It's little Ben. Hi, friend. You want to talk about World War III? Imagine that the Trump administration left the Iranian nuclear deal in place, had allowed billions upon billions of dollars to flow into Iran, the Ayatollahs to strengthen themselves, develop ballistic missiles, create nuclear weapons, and then proceed to launch actual overt wars with Saudi Arabia, Israel, Jordan, surrounding nations. Imagine that, because that's not far off in the imagination, but now they're armed with nuclear weapons and there's nothing you can do about it. That was the Obama administration's plan, and they basically admitted as much. If you're wondering, yes, of course he's not telling the truth here. And the money that went to Iran under Obama was part of a settlement in an international court where we owed them the money they paid us for weapons we did not deliver. America loves selling weapons. And also, Obama used it to negotiate a hostage release, and buddy, these things are just kinda more complicated than how Ben is going to very disingenuously frame them to justify beliefs he already had and is unwilling to change because of who he is. And I'm sure, in a few months, I'll be doing another hour-long video going through all the bullshit he says, and how FOSTA-SESTA still needs to be repealed, and Trump's impeachment, and another QAnon story, but also this whole war we'll probably be doing. And it'll just go around and around and around like some kind of cursed amusement park ride that you can never get off and... Or... We can take a breath. Because I think, I hope, at least with war, maybe, maybe we're fed up enough like, maybe this is the thing. Because not everyone has a goldfish brain. We know all of their moves. All the, the bad guy talk, the anti-American accusations, the history of America abroad. The president literally talking about doing war for oil. So sure, maybe we're just piling on another front to their forever war. We seem to be unable to escape because powerful people don't want to. And the people who want to lead the country are like, if I'm president, I'll tell Congress before I assassinate someone. That's the bar. Who knows what this will escalate to or if it will de-escalate. But as powerful figures maneuver us into more conflicts overseas, endangering, you know, people overseas, and as they say the quiet part loud and use the same tired moves, maybe we can take some solace in an old phrase from a wise man. There's an old saying in Tennessee, I know it's in Texas, probably in Tennessee, that says, fool me once, shame on, shame on you. If fool me, we can't get fooled again. 2020 is gonna be fine. My fingernails are coming loose. Okay, bye. Go to the doctor? We're in America, never mind. We did it, folks. We made it to the end of the first week of the bad year. Thanks for watching and sticking to the end of the video, which I know you did because you're listening to me say this. Be sure to like and subscribe and leave a comment for engagement and check out our patreon.com slash some more news for episodes that aren't sponsored by Skillshare. And also we've got a podcast, it's called Even More News. And you know what? Cross promotion. We have another podcast called Worst Year Ever for another thing. And more cross promotion. Go to youtube.com for videos.